Welcome to our third Red Sneaker Writers Podcast, a podcast with news, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. Thank you for joining us again for this podcast. I'm here with my sound expert, Jesse Ulrich. Jesse, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you again for all your help with that last episode. I thought uh, John Lesquois was fantastic, had so much to say. Do you remember what I promised him we would do on the next podcast? Yes, that we would talk about his album, his musical <laughs> album that he was coming out with. Right, except I went to his, his website and then emailed him. It's not out yet. So no. don't don't judge me for not mentioning it. It's not quite out yet, but as soon as it is, I promise I'll bring it up. I, this... I had that. In, I had that in my notes as well. It's like I need to check to see the albums out. So. <laughs> Good man. That's that's your second job to remember everything. Yes. I forget. <laughs> On this podcast, our very special interview guest is New York Times bestselling. And and just to point out, that's our third multiple New York Times bestselling author in a row. This week, it is the brilliant William Martin who is the author of many historical thrillers that have repeatedly topped the charts and gotten rave reviews, starting with Cape Cod, The Lincoln Letter, most recently Bound for Glory, many of them in the with the series character Peter Fallon. He is an extraordinary writer, an extraordinary talent. Uh, the, the accolades go beyond mere writing. Uh, in 2015, the U.S. Constitution Museum gave him the Samuel Eliot Morrison Award for, get this, quote, patriotic pride, artful scholarship, and an eclectic interest in the sea and things maritime. Just a few years ago, the Mystery Writers of America New England chapter gave him the Robert B. Parker Award, which is Pretty darn company. Good company, I would say. So stay tuned. He has a lot to offer to writers and aspiring writers. But first, the news. Sorry, it took me a second. That's all right. <laughs> first news story today. Just let me say up front, to be perfectly, I, I never expected I would be doing on this podcast a news story that relates to TikTok. I barely even know what TikTok is, except I thought it was a place where young people posted short videos, mostly dancing. And I remember President Trump saying that he was going to ban it, except I guess that didn't happen. And suddenly now here it is, and it's become important, seriously important in the book world. Jesse, can you explain to me what is TikTok? So, okay. Since the front-facing camera showed up on cell phones. There have been multiple social media services that have tried to find the right sort of short video platform for sharing videos. There was Vine uh, a mm -hmm. long time ago that Twitter bought and then killed. There's been uh, there was Snapchat before TikTok, and now there's TikTok, which is more – each of them have a thing, right? And mm -hmm. TikToks is like adding music to it, right? Adding uh, – like a music library to it. So there's a lot of people you, you doing like sort of video karaoke and mm -hmm. whatnot. And I don't fully understand it either. It's a little bit, <laughs> it's, it's for people younger than me, right. but it does seem to be a very good way of every time I'm reading about how to market your podcast better. Mm -hmm. I keep reading about how I should be on TikTok, And I'm like, but I don't understand it. Well, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm going to have to get serious about it because apparently now there's also hashtag book talk which resides within the tiktok universe and it is doing serious business recommending books according to that new york times article that jesse's put up on the screen these videos are mostly made by females young women people in their teens or early 20s who have come to dominate this hashtag book talk and they recommend books often in a very emotional way. The Times article talks about uh, you know, them crying openly about the emotional ending. Well, okay, you may be thinking that's just for kids or something, but it's not. Barnes & Noble CEO James Daunt has also launched his own TikTok channel. Why? Well, he's going to 
he's going to promote books and 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 don't accuse me of being sexist here i'm quoting right from the press release he's he says he will champion books in the popular style of young women who recommend and sometimes disrecommend books here's a quote from shannon devito who is the director of books at barnes and noble she says these creators are unafraid to be open and emotional about the books that made them cry and sob or scream or become so angry they throw it across the room and it becomes this very emotional 45-second video that people immediately connect with. We haven't seen these types of crazy sales, I mean tens of thousands of copies a month, with other social media formats. I mean, historically, we thought that Facebook was the best social media for promoting books, but maybe that's about to change. That's part of why James Daunt has started his own TikTok channel. He says that the, in the stores, they've already set up displays, like in the brick and mortar stores, of book talk titles, and it drives sales more than any other social media format. Tens of thousands of copies a month. Well, I wanted to cover this because I know many of you red sneaker writers are on social media and probably the last thing you want to hear about is one more social media platform that you need to start covering regularly but it sounds like this is already something major and about to become even more major so you need to know about it for that matter in the past week Facebook announced that it's starting its own book publishing platform taking on Amazon's KDP, except I guess here, instead of being aligned with the nation's largest bookseller, you'd be aligned with the nation's largest social media outlet and way of promoting books. For that matter, publishers are beginning to test Clubhouse. I did my first Clubhouse interview yesterday. That's a phone app. It's all audio, but people talk about many things, including how to promote books. And just today, BookBub, which of course is great for promoting ebooks, and they have Chirp, which promotes audiobooks. Now they've started BookBird, which is going to use carrier pigeons to deliver books to people all around the world. Okay, you got that that was an April Fool's joke, right? <laughs> for those of you who are listening to this live. <laughs> That's why you're here, Jesse, <laughs> for stuff like that. Yes, if you're watching this live, it's April Fool's Day. Everybody else may have no idea what's going on. So TikTok, maybe time to download it. Okay, second news story. Still on the web, though, this has to do with Book Club, bookclub.com. I mentioned this on a previous podcast when it was just starting up, but now... They're an actual startup with a website. They've raised $6 million on this platform, which is planning to produce book club discussions with authors for book clubs, except primarily doing it online with Zoom or whatever. Basically, they want to take the Oprah's book club model and move it online. And they're already contracting with individual local book clubs to create various themes and genres and interests. They also have a place you can see on that screen Jesse put up where it says for authors. You authors click on that. I did it because I always test things before I talk about them <laughs> and it takes your information and names and titles. I'm not sure where it goes from there. I think they sort of put you in a data bank. So if one of the book clubs is looking for you or looking for someone who does the kind of thing they do, then you can be contacted. Well, you know, if you can get your book discussed in a book club setting, that's not a bad thing. Word of mouth is still what primarily drives book sales. And even a small club can get the powder keg ignited or get the ball rolling. And one thing leads to another. And that's how great writing careers are built. So you might want to check out Book Club. Article three. And this time we're going to a different website. We're talking about Etsy. What? Etsy, where people are selling their macrame and what? Yes. But apparently people are also selling their fan fiction, which is why I included this story, because I know some of you are writing fan fiction, which is fun, can be popular in a no charge, absolutely free way. A lot of people posting it to Wattpad and whatnot. The problem is, of course, fan fiction is dealing with licensed characters. Harry Potter and people in the Marvel Universe and that sort of thing. So you can write it and post it if you don't charge for it in most cases, but you cannot sell it. 
But what people are doing, according to the article you see up on the screen in The Verge, is sort of making fancy, elegant, bound copies of their fan fiction and selling it on Etsy, not theoretically selling the content, but selling this lovely thing, this book, this binding and cover that they've created. Well, this seems like a pretty thin line to me, not putting on the legal hat, but uh, that I'm I'm not going to be recommending this uh, even for people who like or read fan fiction. I don't know. Jesse, do you read fan fiction? I don't. And I have a question about how this works. Like, <laughs> is it just the binding and the person who receives the binding puts the bo- the the pages in it? Or is it coming with the pages? No, I think it's coming with the pages. I think the story is in there, but they're okay. not theoretically charging for the story because they can't because they don't own the characters. I mean, as you know, since I found out before the podcast that we're both Star Trek geeks, I'll just mention that that may be where fan fiction began, although some would argue that you could take it all the way back to Jane Austen. But for popular culture, Star Trek fan fiction is mm-hmm. perhaps what really got the ball. There have been, uh, I don't know, thousands of, of stories and novels, or but you can't sell them yeah. for profit unless you've got the Paramount Pictures imprimatur, their permission to do it. This is a way people are trying to get around that, but I'm not recommending it. I think they're standing on pretty shaky legal ground because it sure looks a lot like they're selling a book involving somebody else's character. Okay, article number four. This one involves Amazon and a new lawsuit that has been filed. This has probably been the biggest story of the week, but I'm putting it forth because I'm not sure how much I think it's going to amount to. These companies have been sued before, and not much changes. But in this case, it's actually a bookseller who has gotten a law firm to sue Amazon and publishing companies, the big five, basically, which are about to be big four, as you know, if you've followed the podcast, accusing them of price fixing and attempting to, quote, intentionally constrain the book selling market and inflate the wholesale prices of print books. This was started by an Illinois bookstore called Bookends and Beginnings. But of course, they're hoping it'll be much bigger than that. In fact, that screen that you're seeing that Jesse put up is from the law firm's website where they're encouraging other booksellers to join with them. What they're hoping is that this will become a class action suit. They filed it as such. But again, without getting all legal on you, but back in my lawyer days, I dealt with class action suits as a a defendant. And I know it's a difficult an expensive process. First, it's got to be certified by the court, and then you've got to notify people and try and get other plaintiffs to join with you. It takes a long time. Amazon was sued by somebody else earlier this year for similar grounds. You may remember as far as 10 years ago when Apple was sued for much the same, uh, back when they were the leading sellers of eBooks for conspiring to fix prices with uh, the big five publishers, except then I think it was big six. And that ended up leading to about a $400 million settlement. In a way, this is ironic because you'll remember at one time, Amazon had the right to alter anybody's price to discount it. And the big five objected and they negotiated. And eventually the big five won the right to set their own prices, which is why big five eBooks are so much more expensive than anybody else's now. Is that price fixing? I don't know. But I'm letting you know that this is going on because at some point, at least, it might affect writers like you and me. One last story. This comes from Stephen King, who was announced this past week that he has made his house in Maine, has gotten approved to make his house in Maine a writer's retreat. The city approved it. They're going to rezone their Victorian property, which sets on over three acres into a writer's retreat that they hope they can start taking applications for soon. As you can see, it's very much what you would expect it to be. It's spooky and ooky and has bats and gargoyles. And I don't know, as you know, some of you know, I have writer retreats every summer in Eureka Springs because I think it's the most beautiful place in the world. And so inspirational, where better to write? But this place, I, I, I think I would always, of course, I don't write horror. But even if I did, I think I would always be looking over my shoulder 
<laughs> not the kind of tranquil writer's retreat I would want. But somebody else might, so now you know about it. Watch for the formal announcement when this opens. All right, let's move to the interview with William Martin, best-selling author of many extraordinary books, starting with Cape Cod. All the books you see up there, the most recent one is Bound for Gold. He is an extraordinary talent and true artist in our field. Is he there, Jesse? Can we bring Bill into this podcast? We can. Hey, Bill, how you doing? I'm just doing fine, Bill. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for joining this podcast. Glad to be here. Okay, first question, because you've already answered my usual first question, so I had to come up with a new first question for you. So I know you know a lot of words, but now I'm just going to ask for one word. So let's say you're talking to an aspiring writer, and they want one, what is the word that I should be keeping in my head, and I'll, or what should be the mantra that I chant to myself every morning as I'm trying to succeed as a writer? What's that word going to be? Right. (laughs) And and you mean with a W, right? Right. Uh, (laughs) Persist. You know? Uh, Don't take no for an answer. That's the whole idea. Perseverance. Right. Uh, As as Louis L'Amour once said, one of the many famous writers that I occasionally quote, uh, you just have to write. Don't sit and think. Don't don't uh, anticipate. Don't wonder. Uh, the water does the water doesn't flow unless the faucet is turned on, and okay. the only way to do that is to sit down every day and try to fill pages or try to fill fill time. And it's amazing how quickly you will be able to generate uh, enough pages enough words to say well it may not be good but it's got the shape of a novel it has the length of a novel (laughs) maybe we can work it into a novel now that i have all of this raw material which is basically what the first draft is and uh, much easier to revise words than to create something from scratch right Right. And it, it, so do you have sort of a routine? I know you write on a regular basis. How yes. do you approach the day? Well, I come up here every day. <clears throat> this is my office you're sitting in. Uh, I come up here every day, and ha- as I have been for now about 40 years, and uh, sit down and as the, as the, f- the famous New York sports writer Red Smith said, I sit down and open a vein. It's easy. Uh, and and I, I write from or or sit here. Some some writers have have page counts like mm-hmm. like Robert Parker. Parker used to write five pages a day on his on his Spencer book. Uh, and then he got so adept at it that he would write five pages a day in the afternoon on something else. Stephen King had a word has a word count. Mm hmm. For me, it's just the time because I drive myself crazy uh, if I had a five page count every day and I knew by the end of the week when I should have had twenty five pages that I only had ten i I wouldn't right. be able to sleep at night, so I put in eight hours a day and uh and that for me keeps everything working, and I always get something done even if it's not a lot mm-hmm. and uh and in part that's because this never gets easier as right. as you know you may you may get better at it but the same amount of effort and and thought and beating of a head against the wall that I did when I wrote that one back there back bay the my first mm-hmm. book Back bay. Um, back bay was yeah. Uh, I I put in the same amount of effort now. Uh, I might not be quite as uh, as fearful and driven, <laughs> worrying that the the wolf is at the door and what have I done here mm-hmm. by deciding to be a a novelist or a screenwriter, which is was the original intent. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But still, it's the same level of effort every time with every book. And and everybody who listens to a podcast like this and sits down and says, man, this is really hard. Uh, how do I mm. how do I keep doing this? The only way to do it is is just to keep filling pages and then looking back and editing every five days or whatever you decide to do. I think it's important for people to hear that from someone of your stature, because I know I work with people who think writing is so hard. It must just be me. Yeah. I must just not be very good. Mm -hmm. But no, it's just that writing is hard, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, if, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And <laughs> well, you know, uh, but but give them some hope. You said it never gets easy, but surely it's gotten a little easier. Well, a little. I, bit. I think I understand the questions to ask myself now. I mean, so much of because mm -hmm. we first met uh, teaching writing out at the uh, tough work, but somebody has In to Hawaii. do it at the Hawaii Writers Conference. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and. Uh, you know, what I always believed teaching out there is that what I'm trying to help anybody to do who wants to be a writer is to figure out the right questions to ask uh, about mm -hmm. the, the work that they're engaged in, because it is such a solitary profession. It is such a, um, a focused and, and inward looking profession where we spend the whole day alone in a in a space which uh this is philip roth once said is as silent as the bottom of a swimming pool uh although although i have music uh going sometimes here um what we need to be doing constantly is is hearing a voice in our own head and not the characters of a, a critical voice in our own head that is that is telling us uh are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to take take mm -hmm. the characters down that road? Because, you know, if you go down that road, uh, you'll run into an awful lot of trouble with them and you'll cut half of it out later on. OK, go ahead. Try. See what happens. <laughs> Good luck. You know, uh, I'm impressed that you can listen yeah. to music while you're yeah. writing. I couldn't. I, I would start listening yeah. to the music and forget what I was supposed to well, be doing. Do you have a favorite kind of music? Well, what often happens is that I listen to music that is uh, somehow connected with the period that I might be writing in. Um, when I wrote the, the Lincoln Letter about the Civil War, I listened to... Uh, I, Great thank you. Book. I listened to a lot of Civil War related material. I listened to I would listen to the soundtrack to Ken Burns' Civil War. Uh, there was a group mm. of guys um, who used to go around. I think they're the 54th Regiment String Band or some kind of a name like that. And and they they do uh, great arrangements of music that was entirely uh, endemic to the Civil War era. And now the, my new book, which is called December 41, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven because, you know, I, I, I might have been of the, uh, the, the Rolling Stones generation, but my friends always used to tell me I was born 30 years too late because my musical tastes were all related to the big bands and uh, and the vocalists of the 40s. <laughs> so I've been able to listen to a lot of that kind of music. And, um, and now, do you know... That book comes yeah, out that, that later, book will right? be out December 41, which actually begins on December 8th, 1941, and ends on Christmas Eve. Uh, right. Right after Pearl Harbor. It... Um, uh, one of the great little tidbits, since we're talking about the music now, one of the great little tidbits I got out of it was that uh, the number one song on December 7th, it went to the top of the Billboard charts on December 7th, 1941, was Glenn Miller and the orchestra playing Chattanooga Choo Choo. Uh, <laughs> did you work that right, in the book? I did. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Okay, before we go any further, I need to clear something up because I, I I think I said Cape Cod was yeah. your first book earlier, but I'm swapping two bodies yeah. of water, aren't I? Yes. Back yes. Bay came first, right? And did that introduce yes. the Peter Peter Fallon? Uh, that was that that book right, came so out in 1980, and Cape Cod, which is back there, came out. Um, Actually, thirty years ago this month, uh, yeah, and uh, and it's it's never been out of print, and um, people still read it. And it just it it just went to an audio book last year. It hadn't been in an unabridged audio before that. And if you want to, really? if you want to know the uh, the story of uh, of the writer's life, <laughs> I can I can think of. There mm-hmm. are there are a million stories that relate to Cape Cod, but the one that would resonate with what we've just been saying about the first draft and about just writing and getting the material onto the page, I delivered a manuscript. Uh, since I envisioned that book as a kind of Michener version of the story of Cape Cod, and it begins with a whale stranding in 1000 AD and ends in the present, um, I delivered a manuscript that was close to 1,200 pages long. And, yeah. And um, and my editor at Warner Books at the time, uh, her name was Jamie Rabb. She later became the publisher, and uh, she now has a, an imprint called Celadon Books. She, she said to me, we love it, cut 25% of it, and we'll print it. Now... Now, I had spent four years working on that book. So if you cut 25% of it, it basically was like just cutting a year of my life away and throwing it away. Yeah. So oh, so that, for your listeners, is a is the kind of story that should emphasize to them how, how um, committed you have to be, not only to getting it onto the page, but also then to figuring out um, – to figuring out what you what you need to cut, and uh, and and reducing what you have down to a more manageable, a more manageable experience for a reader. Right, my books yeah. get shorter with each draft yeah. too, but yeah. not that dramatically shorter. But but yeah. I, I assume that's a good thing because it gets tighter and uh, oh yeah, you know, quicker, yeah. faster sure. pace. I mean, if and, one could call no. a. 750 page novel faster paced <laughs> yeah yes fast yeah. faster at any rate that's true tra- was there any thought that maybe i can just cut the last fourth and turn that into the start no, of the sequel no i tried to do that with like the next that. book that i wrote which was no. even longer that was called annapolis mm-hmm. about the history history of the navy mm-hmm. and um you know i at, i was at that point in my career where i was kind of positioning myself as a kind of Michener like writer. Um, even though mm-hmm. I think I always tried to have more of a plot line going through my books than, than you will see in a, in a Michener chronicle like Chesapeake. Uh, and that plot, that, that plot line, that through line would, would hold every era of time to the next one. Um, so with Annapolis, I thought at the end of the civil war segment that maybe I could cut it right there, uh, and pick up with the second volume, like, like Herman woke. I mean, if Herman woke can do it, so mm-hmm. can I. <laughs> and, right. Right. And, uh, um, more. and the publisher said, no, no, what you do is you, you put it all into one volume for us. That's what we want you to do with, with this one. <clears throat> Therefore, World War II in that novel, Annapolis, ends with the Battle of Midway. There, there really isn't anything else. And that's 1940. That's 1942. It's clear that you were committed to writing, really wanted to write, maybe not novels at first, but have always had a passionate interest uh, in writing. Well, Where'd that come from? You know, when I was a kid, I used to, I was an only child. Mm-hmm. And... I had no problem at all enjoying my own company 
sitting down and reading a book or going up into the attic and uh, and sitting there and drawing right. pictures of battle scenes that I had that I had read about and so forth of, of basically entertaining myself. And here I am all these years later. And, and this is the attic. I'm sitting up in the attic right. again doing the same sort of thing. But I wanted to direct movies. And and so after uh, mm-hmm. college and a couple of years of construction in order to get the money, uh, I went to the USC film school out in California. And um, I quickly decided that the best way into the movie business, uh, if you didn't have an uncle in the business, and I didn't, was was to write a good screenplay, something that you could hold up and say, here, read this, see what you think, give me a job. And um, modeling myself after a lot of people who had just gone through the USC film school, like George Lucas and John Milius and people like that, I started, I, <laughs> I started writing screenplays. And... Um, Nobody wanted to produce right. the screenplays, even b- because I was writing historical stuff at that moment in time when uh, mm-hmm. most people were looking to make the next Easy Rider or movies like that. So I um, I remember sitting down with a producer who said to me after I had pitched her some idea, uh, you know the way you write. And when they say it to you like that, get ready because because you're on the way out the door. You know the way you write, (laughs) you ought to write a novel. And I had the idea for Back Bay kicking around in Mm. my head. Buried treasure beneath the streets of Boston, lost lost in the landfill, the cities built out over the landfill. And, And I had had that idea in my head as a kind of boyhood fantasy since we had first heard the geographical story of the history of Boston when I was in the fourth grade. That that may sound apocryphal, Mm -hmm. but it's true. And um, and so Mm -hmm. being well supplied with what I called uh, the arrogance of naivete, something that every writer, every potential artist needs to have the the willingness to say to those people who are going to uh, tell you how hard it is, which we've already told you, um, the willingness to say, well, yeah, but right. I'm the one who will beat the odds. I'm the one for whom the, the difficulties, mm-hmm. I will overcome those difficulties. You know, kind of like uh, um, Han Solo in Star Wars. Don't tell me the odds. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and you did beat the odds. Okay, would this be a good time to and I'm hoping in advance that you'll forgive me for this. Would this <laughs> would this be a good time to mention humanoids of the deep? When you're in Hollywood, you're trying to get work. You try to make as many friends as you can among the uh in the in the world of uh film producing. And I was fortunate at USC to be in, uh, to have a professor who had, uh, who was also a playwright and a screenwriter who had written movies for Roger Corman, like some of them are pretty famous death race, 2000 with Keith Carradine, bloody mama right. with Shelley Winters, that one too. playing uh, <laughs> Ma Barker. This was the Corman would make movies, uh, Based, up, based upon whatever trend he was seeing. Bonnie and Clyde was a huge hit, so he'd make one about Ma Barker. And that movie, by the way, has has a young Robert De Niro, a young Bruce Dern, a bunch of other characters that you would... And it was directed by Scorsese. Well, anyway, wow. uh, his story editor... Uh, I was introduced to his story editor by this professor, a guy named Robert Tom, and and she promised to give me a job writing a screenplay. And I had written the first draft to Back Bay. We had moved back to Boston. I had written it back here for the princely sum of $7,500. That was my advance on Back Bay. And um, I had just finished it when she called me up and said, we have an assignment for you. And 
the assignment was humanoids from the deep. And all they gave me was uh, the title and the tagline. And the tagline was, they're not human, but they hunt human women. Not, not for killing, <laughs> for mating. And if you've seen the movie, you know how that all unfolds in the, in the movie. But um, from, uh, from that came the experience of working in Roger Corman's College of B-Movie Knowledge. And uh, and I learned I learned a lot about mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. about storytelling. I, and I, you know, the other thing, the other thing that I learned, I'm much just... happier doing this <laughs> than, than right, right. And even that that movie, by the way, which came out in the summer of 1980, was uh, according to one chart that I've read was the third most financially successful movie of that summer. Uh, I can't remember what number two was, but number one was The Empire Strikes Back. So I was in pretty, I was in pretty good company that, <laughs> then as well. Whoa. However, Roger Corman's no business kidding. model was to find young talent. I just mentioned Scorsese. Uh, everybody everybody mm -hmm. started with Roger and he did. Corman. Yeah. Uh, and uh, pay them very little and give them no profit participation uh, and let them let them learn how to make movies along the way. Mm -hmm. So I was. I know, I know. Mm -hmm. And he found you as well. <laughs> All right. I think it's time to turn to some of the questions people have been sending in through the chat box. But before we do that, Jesse, I have one that somebody emailed me this afternoon and I promised I'd ask. She wants to know, Bill, have you ever been tempted to use uh, any of your personal history or family history in any of your books? Uh, not too much. Although, you know, the Martins... Uh, my father and his brothers were, were great storytellers who, who loved to talk about their days growing up in the, uh, what's known as the South end of Boston, not South Boston. That's a different section. The South end, which was, uh, uh, uh in the twenties and thirties and forties, a pretty tough neighborhood. Now it's all completely gentrified and is, is, uh, uh, very expensive place to live, but, um, their stories to me of running the floating crap games and dealing with the boot, mm, dealing with stuff. the bootleggers and doing all of that stuff all made it into one of my novels, which, which is set in that area in 1916 called the rising of the moon. Uh, so yeah, I worked, I took some family history and stories there. Uh, but by and large, um, I travel so far. I travel so far and wide in my in my storytelling life that I that I don't really draw too much on background like that. I will sure. tell you this though, uh, mm -hmm. and I just realized this in think about this myself recently. Most of the time, the main character in in like Peter Fallon or uh, mm -hmm. the main character in my new book is from Boston. <laughs> he might be yeah. my, my, <laughs> the main character in my new book is, uh, we first meet him in Los Angeles. He's working at Warner brothers, but he began in Boston and the, you know, his, I won't tell you too much about the plot. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give too much of it away, but the, uh, but sure. the story, um, is a world war two th manhunt thriller and um, uh, this character is from Boston and has some of the similar aspects of uh, of my background. So mm -hmm. it just naturally so it maybe, just naturally works its way in, you know. Of course, uh, you use yeah. what you know. You, you wrote about lawyers, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the first one was from Oklahoma. Although, can I, can I, so, before we go on, let me just say one thing about, about sure. the writing what you know part. I've always believed that even though I, I turn to characters that are somewhat similar to myself in background, um, 
I've always believed that you don't write what you know. You write what you want to find out or where you want to go or who you want to meet when you get there, you know. And mm. and that's kind of sure. been the thing that's driven me along and allowed me, even though this is a fairly constrained little space up here, to have traveled to a lot of different places in my imagination in the course of writing all of these books. So, yeah. yeah. That's terrific. Mm. All right. Let's have another one of those questions, Jesse. Well, if you're not getting inspiration from your family history, where's the strangest place you got inspiration for a novel? Um, well, it isn't so much the place as the inspiration itself. The place is just a short distance from here. I was driving along with my wife. I was in a car, uh, obviously. I was driving. And um, this is right after I had finished Back Bay, and I didn't know what I would do next. And, um, mm -hmm. and nobody knew that the book would do as well as it, as it turned out to do, because if it, if we had, uh, my agent might've said, you know, you really ought to do one just like that. Again, you ought to follow up back bay with something quite similar to it. Um, no, they didn't tell me that I had finished back bay. I had finished humanoids and I pull up behind a car and I look at the bumper sticker and the bumper sticker said, Bequeath thy kidneys. It was promoting organ transplantation. And I said, what would happen if a character gets an organ transplant, becomes fascinated by the, the donor who has given him life and goes to thank mm -hmm. the family and becomes involved in the, the whole experience of the family and, uh, and, the, and the plot that killed the person who was the donor. And at the end of the story, the main character finds himself in the same situation that the donor was in at the beginning of the story. And that, that, that whole inspiration came from a bumper sticker. Boom. Right, right there. Wow. And that, that became a book called nerve endings, which uh, came out, which was the second book that I wrote it was a thriller. I didn't, I didn't want to write another mm -hmm. historical novel right away. I wanted to write something completely different, but still mainstream type fiction. That's what, that's what, that's what we write. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet something with an interesting character hook. Every book has a different, a different inspiration, a different idea that will right. drive us to, um, uh, to say, this is what I want to do. You know, Back Bay, as I say, came from a fourth grade geography class. Uh, the, my third novel, which is called The Rising of the Moon. That's the one that's about Boston and Ireland in the weeks before the Easter Rebellion. Uh, I was just befuddled. I didn't know what I'd write next. And I started playing with good opening lines. You know, Joseph Heller, after he wrote Catch-22, uh, didn't know what he was going to do next. And so he just wrote the word, something happened. And that became his next novel. <laughs> yeah. That's where that book and, came from. And, huh? and that was the first yeah. line of the novel. I, I have to say, I've never read that one. Mm -hmm. uh, my father-in-law read it long, long ago, and I asked him, well, how was it? He said, well, nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> Hard to follow right, an act right. like Catch-22. But 22. I started writing down good opening lines, right. and, the, and I wrote one called Bless Me, Father, For I Have Sinned, which is the opening line of confession. Mm. And that just... Out of that, a scene blossomed, and then a story came from that. So it's different every time. Don't you think part of the reason that works, though, is because you do work regularly. You write every day or close to it, so your subconscious is always kind of looking for material. That's You're true. always in writer yeah. mode. Writers, writers never rest. Uh, I, I will try to turn my brain off at the end of the day uh, and try not to think about it or stress too much about it. I've given up stressing about it. Um, Good. Well. <laughs> All right, Jesse, let's have another question. How much time do you spend in research? Well, it, it usually turns out to be about an, a, a, a year. You know, it, it takes me about three. Just for the research? Well, really? it takes me about three years to write a book. 
to, to bring a book out. I like um, the the historian Nathaniel Philbrick talks about a year for research, a year for writing, and a year for selling, and that's a pretty good uh, barometer uh, of how much time it may take me, I or a little bit longer. And it isn't that I'm sitting there every single day researching like a PhD candidate, going to libraries, which I really don't do much anymore, simply because we have this. This this right. has the the you know uh, almost everything you need to know you can find right here. You'll initially be, uh, do a, once you get an idea, you'll start reading the the broadest outlines and the grand grandest texts that you can find about about the particular subject matter the uh, harvard yard for example a book that i wrote uh that came out in 03 it's a uh, a chronicle novel about the history of harvard uh in which we follow the uh harvard from a one room schoolhouse the puritan seminary on the charles to the vast wealthy complex institution that it is today and 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 use that as a parallel to follow american history from its time as a as a puritan theocracy to what it is today mm-hmm. and um uh so the first thing you're going to read is three centuries of harvard by samuel Eliot morrison uh which is the, the kind of the grandest example of harvard history but later on you're going to be reading very specific things about courses and how they were born and and, uh, and other uh, minutiae that you can build into the book so that it feels as if uh, it's it's real mm-hmm. you need to have you need to have good detailing throughout any historical novel right um, you need to know in the history say of, of the Navy uh, what the battles were all about but you also need to understand uh, uh, what the diet of the soldier of the of the sailors was who were fighting those battles in the 18th century and and beyond and all of that stuff feeds into uh, mm-hmm. f- feeds into research plus walking the ground doing as much outdoor re- research as you can bill what do you think lies in the future of publishing i mean we've seen pretty tumultuous changes in the past yeah. 10 or 12 mm-hmm. years where do you think we're going? Uh, well, it appears as if, uh, despite the antitrust suits you were talking about right. and so forth, it appears we're heading toward uh, the vision that um, uh, Amazon has has tried to bring forward, which is that, uh, well, as they said, they wanted to democratize publishing. And... Um, eliminate all of the so-called gatekeepers. What they really meant was we just want to make it easy for us to put as much out there as possible. Um, Because we need editors. We need, we need people to, who are professionals in the business of uh, analyzing a story and and telling you as people whom you will respect, you need to cut 25% out of this because right. if you don't <laughs> nobody's going to read it you know um we need no, all everybody of, benefits yeah we need all of that sort of thing and yeah. and i mean you just you were doing a, a little bit earlier a countdown mm-hmm. of how many of how the the major publishers keep consolidating and and keep right. keep becoming fewer and fewer and what ultimately will happen is that uh while lots more people will be able to get a book out, tell a story, uh, take the time at some point in their lives to write something that that gets published. I think it's harder and harder for people to have lifelong careers as uh, as novelists, surely. Or, and usually authors of nonfiction will also be professors and journalists and so forth but it's going to be very difficult i think to sustain um a 40 year career uh or right. as in your case you're you're a little bit younger than i am you know you you've had a pretty 30 years yeah, you, yeah. You, you're <laughs> you, yeah so you started 
a long time ago too. And and to be able to say, right. yeah, we never had to have a real job once we started doing that. <laughs> that's yeah. winning. Yeah, uh, that's terrific. Bill, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. It's, uh, it's always nice to talk to you and to all your friends out Likewise. there. Likewise. Take care. A few parting words before we sign off. I'm going to start teaching a series of talks, doing a series of talks online on various literary topics starting this Sunday. The first one is about Jane Austen, and the one the following Sunday is sort of the history of the mystery novel, which I think might interest, well, any of them might interest some of you, who knows, but if you'd like to learn more about that, go to contextlearning.com. That's context, C-O-N-T-E-X-T, learning.com. Next time, my guest is going to be, you guessed it, yet another New York Times bestselling author, Jacqueline Michard. You'll want to be here for that. But if for some reason you can't be, send me by email your questions in advance and I'll make sure they get asked. My email address is willburn at gmail.com. That's first four letters of both names, W-I-L-L-B-E-R-N at gmail.com. Remember, if you subscribe to the William Bernhardt YouTube channel, you will be notified as soon as each one of these live streams begins so subscribe and of course most importantly keep writing stay healthy stay safe and remember you cannot fail if you refuse to quit see you next time 